Hello everyone. My name is Ur Kira. I am senior specialist STEM for containers in here in AWS. Today, uh, with my colleague Wesley, we will talk about scaling aspect of Landbit and provide you more insight around uh, it based on our uh, experience. Here is our agenda. We will consider scaling considerations, scaling best practices, and we will mention, we will discuss the worker concept with Flanbit, and we will present some benchmarking uh, uh, statistics. So to start with, while we are we talk with uh, when we are talking scaling of your log delivery pipeline, you need to. The, you need to consider three main focus areas. For particularly, you need to consider your source capabilities, which means the total CPN memory uh, capacity of your worker node, the throughput, network throughput that your worker node has. And second, you need to consider the, your destination capabilities. What is the ingestion rate that your destination uh, can consume this destination can be Kinesis, data stream, CloudWatch logs, or any other uh, destination. But you need to understand the throttling and ingestion rate of your destination. This has the direct impact on your throughput and performance of your log delivery pipeline. And then you need to uh, consider the performance and the uh, uh, performance and actual throughput of your pipe, which is the Flanbit daemon in this case. So you need to understand Flanbit uh, fully. You need to uh, optimize the, uh, the its configuration, and you need to actively monitor your pipeline. And another aspect while we are talking about scaling is you need to choose the right filter and understand its characteristic. And this is the way really uh, vital when we are talking about scaling. Let's take an example of uh, take Kubernetes filter as an example. And as you know, one of the characteristic of this Kubernetes filter is for each pod, it queries the API endpoint to get some extra metadata uh, to enrich your logs. And this metadata, pod IDs, labels, and annotation. However, this the this task to enrich your logs and querying API endpoint to get this metadata about your uh, logs and where it uh, attempt to provide more put more context to your logs. It gen it add additional work on your API endpoint, which may. Uh, impact your uh, performance and scale of your uh, log, de log delivery pipeline. And here, this is the default behavior. And one thing I want to call out, there is a new proposal uh, of, for that. And within this uh, conference series, there is a lightning talk called Scaling the Philanbit Kubernetes Filter in a large cluster. And the, our colleagues that take different approach to get the similar uh, metadata information rather than from uh, directly API uh, endpoint, they tend to rely on the kubelet to obtain those information, which uh, reduce the load on the API servers. And is really interesting to watch if you didn't uh, watch it yet. And Another thing you need to consider is you, whenever possible, you need to offload your workload uh, to the source and you need to apply filtering. How you can do the filtering? You can uh, use friended filter. So in a successful log delivery pipeline, you need to only ship the logs or information data that really add value for your business. And there is no point to uh, stream a log that doesn't have any business uh, value. So you can use fill and filters to filter the uh, your logs at source level. 
Flatbit has a data stream feature, which can be also used to filter and process your data uh, and log as source. And when we come to the scaling best practices, first thing, as mentioned, you need to understand your uh, the the behavior of your uh, the behavior of your filter and plugins that you are using. And here we mentioned the Kubernetes uh, filter uh, generate an extra lot on your API service. You need to know this. And moreover, by default, it append pod labels and annotation to do your uh, log records to add as a context. And here, in case, the, most of the time, these labels and annotation doesn't have any uh, business value, it's more Kubernetes specific thing. So, but it adds an extra load on your uh, logging delivery pipeline. So you can consider to disable them whenever possible as seen below. And the third thing that you can do is you can use the memory buffet limit option in large cluster, which is dis disabled by default. And here, uh, based on our testing and what we recommend to set it uh, some value between uh, 50 megabyte to 100 megabyte based on the workload. And there is a nice article called Back Pressure in this Finland bit documentation, which really uh, explain this in detail and help you to uh, determine the right value for that. And along with memory buffer limit, you can also uh, enable file system buffering. And this will also help as large scale and will ensure the data and log integrity in case your log destination is not able to cope with the load or there's any uh, technical problem there on destination side. And for CloudWatch uh, logs, we recommend to use the high performance CloudWatch logs plugin called CloudWatch underscore logs. And based on this information we mentioned, we have a optimized full end configuration in our container inside uh, page. So I recommend you to review this configuration and try to make your full end uh, configuration as close as possible to the configuration we shared under the container site uh, documentation. And last best practices uh, that I want to recommend is uh, monitoring health of your log delivery uh, mechanism. This is really important and but an ignored aspect. Uh, Flanbit has a built-in HTTP server comes, uh, comes with it and you can enable this in your Flanbit uh, config, configuration as you see here, and then you can use a really nice Grafana dashboard where it will tell you the help will provide you more. Now I am handing over to my uh, colleague Wesley, who will uh, talk about worker concept and how worker concept uh, helps with scaling aspect of Flint. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Wesley. Um, I am um, one of the co-maintainers of Fluentbit. I've contributed a lot of code to it uh, for uh, AWS uh, plugins. Um, so I'm going to explain how concurrency works in Fluentbit, which is important for understanding um, scaling with uh, Fluentbit and the new worker feature that was introduced. So. so um, prior to workers, this is how concurrency worked in Fluentbit. Um, Fluentbit uses a model called coroutines. Uh, coroutine, I believe, is short for cooperative routine. Um, basically, um, technically, Fluentbit has uh, multiple like uh, p threads in use, but um, before workers, without or without workers, um, only a single thread is active at a time, and threads cooperatively pass execution between each other. Um, so what will happen is you can think of this like, so there's like the Fluentbit core engine. Um, it gets some task 
like let's say there's some chunk of data that needs to be sent to an uh, um, sent to an uh, output destination. So then what it will do was it will invoke a uh, coroutine for the output that runs the output code, um, pass execution to it, which means the engine thread basically uh, moves execution to the coroutine. So now only the coroutine is, is active. Coroutine performs some work. When it hits a network IO call, um, rather than blocking on that call and, and you know, blocking into all execution. Instead, it will make the network call, but then it will uh, pass execution and yield back to the engine, which will then uh, take control and it can then uh, run other coroutines to complete other tasks. Um, and when the network, uh, when the uh, kernel notifies the engine that the network call has completed, then the coroutine can be uh, uh, unpaused, it can it, basically it will be sleeping and it can be um, uh, activated again. So um, the way it essentially worked is, is works is that there, there is concurrency and in some sense there is multiple threads, but only one of them is active at a time and they're um, cooperatively and intelligently basically turning themselves on or off um, so that um, network IO calls basically don't ever uh, um, slow down the execution of the problem of the program. Uh, essentially, it's just to do asynchronous network IO. Um, but then now in FluentBit, uh, as of uh, 1.7, uh, we have the 1.7 series, we have uh, multi-workers. So with workers, um, you can increase, you, you can have multiple threads active at a time. Um, and basically, the simple story is that workers uh, are just dedicated threads uh, for outputs. So here we have an example here um, with an output. You put workers one that enables a single dedicated thread just for that output. Um, workers still actually have can have coroutines inside of them, um, which means you're still doing um, a like non-blocking network I/O to make things efficient um, and fast. It's just that now the coroutines for the output um, are all happening in the context of a, a single um, or, or an extra dedicated thread just for that output. And of course, you can enable more than one worker if you want. Um, but I think in most situations, probably folks um, throughput needs can be satisfied with a single dedicated thread. Um, now, so. How 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 is uh, how are con uh, concurrency and workers implemented in the actual code in the plugins? Um, so basically, all plugins have a flush uh, callback um, function that they must implement, which is called um, when they are need to be given logs that then they can send. And basically, in order to have concurrency, the calls to this function must be fully independent. Um, basically, it, it can't be storing state. Um, there is a um, context object that basically this function can have that allows it to store state in between uh, between different calls. But if you are storing state in your output plugin, then that prevents you from being able to uh, have concurrency um, because it you know it means that basically the engine can't independently ex uh, have you send multiple chunks at the same time. Um, also. Another key thing, and this kind of follows from from that one, is that you can't have your API can't have any sort of guarantee, require ordering, um, where calls must be made, you know, in some sort of like order in a series, um, because there's no guarantee that that will happen when you're when you're running concurrently, because one coroutine might be, you know, performing a network call and will be sleeping, and then another another coroutine might start sending. Um, before the network call for the first sleeping coroutine might finish. Um, so that is one issue. Uh, with workers, um, basically, almost any plugin, I think, should be able to support, uh, pretty much any plugin should build output, should build to support um, workers um, with only minor uh, uh, code changes. Um, concurrency support, interestingly, is actually not needed in order to support um, a single worker, the ability to have users configure a single worker. So the reason for that is that basically workers are a dedicated thread. Um, 
even if your output is like synchronous and it's not doing and it's basically doing blocking network IO instead of non blocking um, co routine network IO, you could still have a dedicated thread and then just do all of those synchronous calls in the dedicated thread. So basically, workers can, can still help. Now, if you want to let your users enable multiple workers in the output, then you also need to support concurrency because if you have multiple workers, then that's um, you can think of that as kind of equivalent to at least having uh, coroutines, except for now it's processed on multiple uh, threads. Um, interestingly, as a side note, if, if folks are familiar with Golang and like coroutines, multiple workers, which means multiple threads, and then the coroutines operating inside them, I th I'm pretty sure like uh, fundamentally in terms of the programming model, it's a lot like it's kind of a lot like the Go scheduler running uh, Go routines um, onto actual real threads. Um, anyway, so this is just looking some more at the code. How do you enable uh, concurrency in workers? So um, if, if you had an output that you maintained for Flink bit, so concurrency is enabled by default for all outputs. You can turn it off with this uh, little line of code there. I wrote a whole developer guide that explains this actually a little bit more if you want to really understand what this is doing here. But there's basically, and there's this thing called an upstream influent bit, which is a core networking concept representing um, uh, basically an endpoint that you're connecting to. And you can disable asynchronous calls, which will disable concurrency. Um, and then there's this other call that you have to make, which will then allow people to configure workers if they want. Um, OK, so then talking some more about uh, worker and concurrency support in the plugins that I maintain. So I maintain the AWS plugins in FluentBit, and there are four of them. There's S3, CloudWatch, uh, Kinesis Streams, and Kinesis Firehose. Um, so uh, basically, um, support for workers and concurrency varies. Um, so when we're talking about um, concurrency support, um, that's supported basically the Kinesis Streams and Kinesis Firehose plugins, they support everything. They support any number of workers and they also support concurrency. Um, the S3 plugin can support uh, concurrency and multiple workers, but only if you're enabling put object. And I'll show that as the API that it uses to upload S3. And I'll show that in a moment. Um, and then there is CloudWatch Logs, which uh, doesn't support concurrency, unfortunately, but it, it can support a single worker. Um, because as I noted, any output basically can support a single uh, worker, which is a dedicated thread that then operations can happen in synchronously. Um, so here's just some example uh, output definitions to show what, the, what, uh, what this all looks like. I'm omitting uh, some of the required fields that you have to configure for these outputs. Um, you can see in Kinesis Streams or Kinesis Firehose, you can enable any number of workers that you want. Um, in S3, with the default multi-part upload mode, which um, can only be enabled uh, if you, which only happens if you, if you have a, f a file size that's uh, above, I think, 12 megabytes. Um, but anyway, you can enable a single worker. This will be um, uh, synchronous calls, um, uh, but happening in a dedicated thread. The reason why S3 multi-part is non-concurrent is because the multi-part uploads are a series of calls, and they require storing state, basically. So they're, they're, the plugin is not stateless. Um, this is something that I've thought about probably there there probably is a way to uh, allow it to to work um, with multiple threads, but um, I, I need to rewrite the code and think a little bit more about that. Um, anyway, so then S3 was put object mode. So put object mode is an API where you are you just send an object in a single request. And so that can be done concurrently, which means you can enable any number of workers, and it's fine. Um, and then finally, up here at the top, we have CloudWatch. Um, Unfortunately, it doesn't support concurrency. The reason is because um, there's this th concept of a sequence token in the put log events API, which basically means, um, it kind of basically means that um, calls to the API have to be ordered, um, where something obtained from the output of a previous call must be sent in your next call. So this means you have no concurrency. You can only enable one worker um, as a dedicated thread for the output. 
kind of which it will run synchronously in. Um, in a moment, Uger's going to show some benchmarking results. Surprisingly, despite the fact that there's no concurrency, um, it actually still performs pretty well. Um, anyway, so wrapping up um, concurrency and, and worker support. So these are like the unsolved remaining problems um, for the FluentBit community and FluentBit core to... to um, anyway, now I will turn it back over to Uger, who will go over some... Uh, uh, benchmarking results uh, for FluentBit with workers. Thank you, Wesley, for your insight around uh, workers and concurrency. Now I will provide some more insight how different destination uh, and log delivery pipelines uh, perform uh, with and without workers enabled. And particularly in this session, we will consider Amazon CloudWatch logs and Amazon Kinesis Data Stream as a destination. And here you see the details of our benchmarking setup. And we will start with a, a workload on CloudWatch logs. So imagine you have a, a production environment which generate around 8,500 uh, logs per second. And this is without worker enabled. And keeping all other variables uh, more or less the same. And by just enabling the worker on your fluent bit configuration, we see an uh, increased throughput in terms of processing rate of fluent bit. And as we see here, enabling worker nodes and by keeping all the other variables uh, uh, stable has really major impact and improve the log processing uh, performance uh, dramatically. And when we look to the uh, the logs uh, delivered in terms of uh, logs delivered in terms of network performance, and here uh, the similar workload generate used to generate two megabyte per second uh, logs and stream the, the capacity over uh, this was the capacity over pipe and parallel to increase in the uh, number of logs that is pro, uh, number of logs that has uh, processed in previous slide and after enabling the workload the uh, delivery throughput in terms of networking also increased as we see here. So one thing additional we did is like we wanted to see uh, impact of the work enabling work on or our resource con consumption and uh, and how the how it uh, what are the extra load it brings in terms of CPU and memory to do our cluster. So here are just numbers when we uh, we get while we test the uh, uh, full end bit uh, with without worker uh, for with uh, 1,000 and 5,000 uh, logs per second. And this is the CPU and memory uh, values we captured on the full end bit. Uh, Ports that uh, stream the log, and when we have the similar workload, when we enable the workload, what we re we see is the memory utilization is more or less the same, and there is no any increase, and the CPU utilization increased slightly, and. When we look the same figures at 5,000 logs per second with worker enabled, we see an increase on uh, CPU utilization, and whereas the memory utilization more or less stays stable. So this means enabling worker have an uh, addition uh, has a minimal impact on the resource consumption and where the uh, memory utilization at pod level remain more or less uh, more or less stable and it caused an increased CPU utilization. And now when we be benchmark the uh, 
Kinesis data stream. So we built a pipeline, log pipeline, including data stream, where you use the uh, firehouse to stream the data to the S3. So log generated through the Kinesis data stream, the data firehouse shipped into the S3. And here the view on AWS console. And here, imagine we have the setup running and in our production, we generate around 4,000 4, logs per second. And then keeping all other variables the same by just enabling the workload, we see that uh, our process, uh, incoming process rate increased dramatically. And when we look at the increase in terms of uh, networking throughput, and we will experience the same, uh, where uh, parallel to uh, processing increase in processing rate of the logs, our throughput also increased. And one thing here, these numbers are not the max, max throughput limits of the setup. It is just how a worker can impact your uh, uh, log delivery performance by just enabling them rather than the maximum capacity of the limits. And with Kinesis data stream, you also need to think about the uh, number of shards that you have and the throttling at Kinesis level as well. This also contributes to the performance of your log delivery pipeline. 